Hello, family, and welcome. We're Bob and Penny Lord, and we have one of Mary's most devoted sons to bring to you today, St. Louis Marie de Montfort, slave of Mary and prophet of the last days. The writings of St. Louis Marie de Montfort have left such a mighty impact that thousands upon thousands of the faithful make a total consecration to Mary through his true devotion to Mary. On January the 31st, 1673, St. Louis Marie de Montfort was born. The following day, the baby, wrapped securely in woolen blankets, was brought to the parish church where he was formally baptized and welcomed into the church. From his very early days, he had a great devotion to Our Lady. Through his association with Jesuit professors, Louis developed a desire to become a missionary and a martyr. Hearing stories about the Jesuits who won the battle for Jesus in North America, Louis, too, wanted to go to Canada and evangelize. But Our Lady had other work for him to do. She would give him his heart's desire to become a martyr, but not in the way that he thought. Truly believing he was being guided by divine providence, Louis cared not whether he had money in his pockets, clothes on his back, or a roof over his head. He just walked the road on which he believed the Lord had sent him. He prayed for hours in front of the statue of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Louis felt the call to the priesthood. A business associate of Louis's father offered to be his benefactor, pay his way to the to study at the seminary of Saint Sulpice in Paris. It took him ten days to walk the two hundred and twenty six miles to Paris to be sure that he was dependent only on the Lord. He gave his money and possessions to a beggar. He even exchanged his clothes with him so that when he arrived in Paris, he looked like a beggar himself. The journey had been atrocious. He looked terrible. This huge, looming stature, coupled with his unkempt appearance, caused people to be frightened of him, or at least desirous to keep him at a safe distance. He begged for food and lodging. Whatever help he did get was given to him begrudgingly, but he didn't care. Only the Lord. He created a battle cry, God alone. After six months, his benefactor's (coughs) reserves diminished and he was on his own. He lived in communities with other starving seminarians. The first two years were spent in the University of Sorbonne and the last six under the priests at Saint-Sulpice. Louis was exposed to the best of Paris and the worst. Saint-Sulpice was located on the Rive Gauche, the left bank, but he concentrated on the courses afforded him. As he progressed in his studies using sacred scripture as his basis, his mission manifested itself to him. He was to be an itinerant preacher going from village to village proclaiming the good news of Jesus. Louis experienced many crosses in Paris. Had he known in advance, he would have welcomed them anyway. He had learned to embrace the cross passionately. And to accommodate him, God sent him heavy crosses because he loved Louis so much. After eight years in Paris, under extremely painful conditions, Louis-Marie de Montfort was ordained on June 5, 1700. But that didn't mean his crosses at the hands of the Sulpicians were over. Although they ordained him, they did not give him his faculties as a preacher and confessor. He accepted this as another cross from the Lord. When Louis-Marie asked to go to Canada looking for Hurons or Iroquois, whom he could convert, a Sulpician laughed contemptuously, you in Canada? <laughs> Looking for the Indians, you'd get lost among the trees. And so Louis waited. An old priest came to saint Sulpice and asked Louis to be a missionary for his community. Louis jumped at the chance. Upon his arrival, he found the community more worldly than the Sulpicians in Paris. Providence came to him in the form of his sister being clothed in the habit of a convent some distance from Nantes. The convent was run by the king's former mistress, Madame de Montespan, who had converted after the king dropped her, but who wielded much power in all circles, church and otherwise. Louis' sincerity and piety overwhelmed her. When she asked him what he wanted to do, he said he wanted to work with the poor in the missions. She suggested he speak to the bishop of Poitiers. Although quite a distance, Louis set out for Poitiers on foot. After finishing celebrating Mass for the nuns, he spied a blind beggar at the door of the chapel and asked if he would like to see. When he responded yes, Louis moistened his fingers with saliva, placed them on the beggar's eyes, and prayed to the Lord Jesus and Mother Mary. The beggar opened his eyes and saw. This is the first recorded miracle attributed to St. Louis-Marie de Montfort. When he arrived in Poitiers, finding the bishop out of town, Louis-Marie asked permission to wait for him in the hospital chapel. 
He was praying when the hospital personnel took him for a beggar and took up a collection. Louis began ministering to the personnel, the patients, then the people in the streets and in the prison. By the time the bishop arrived, Louis had won the hearts of the people. The bishop wanted Louis to take charge of the spiritual direction of the old hospital, but needing to know more about him, he wrote letters to Louis's previous superiors. The bishop had to leave town for a month and told his vicar to let Louis do whatever he thought best to bring the souls of Poitiers to the Lord. Louis, taking the bishop at his word, went ministering to everybody in sight, in the hospital, the schools, the prisons, the marketplace. He started lay organizations, gave alms to the poor. He virtually took over Poitiers, and the people loved him. Then he was called back to Nantes, and he walked back to Nantes about 98 miles. By making this sacrifice, as soon as he arrived, he was given all his faculties to hear confessions as well as to preach. Father Louis went from one town to another, then to another, and still another. By the time the Bishop of Poitiers caught up with him, he had been out in the country for three months, and the people loved him. But the people in Poitiers loved him as well. The bishop wanted him back. As he was too overpowering for the priests at the mission in Nantes, the good superior allowed Louis to go back to Poitiers with his blessings and a healthy stipend which Father Louis gave to the poor on the way back to Poitiers. Our Lord and Our Lady blessed him in all the missions he gave. He experienced his greatest successes in towns where most would not have given him the slightest chance of reaching the people. He was able to get to the most incorrigible citizens back into the church. People who had never heard the name of Jesus now prayed the rosary and marched in possession. He, the huge, blustering, oddball priest, was known as the gentle priest when it came to the confessional. The people loved him and wanted to stay with him. The number of conversions were in great swells. They called Father Louis the good priest from Montfort. You would think the pounding and beating Father Louis Marie was subjected to at the hands of the demons at night in his little room would have been enough. They were the least. The slings and arrows of ungrateful men were what wounded him the most. They went after him no matter where his mission took him in the diocese of Poitiers. The bishop could see all the good that was being done through his work, but he bowed to the pressure of political powers, and Father Louis-Marie de Montfort, Mary's hero, found himself exiled from the diocese again. Father Louis wanted to preach missions. If he was not able to do that in Poitiers, he would ask the Pope where he could. Louis needed direction. He enjoyed the slurs and slings of outrageous men. It brought him closer to the kingdom, but he felt he may possibly have been spinning his wheels in Poitiers or that his work was done there, and the Lord was trying to tell him that it was time to move on. It's very difficult to visualize anyone walking from Poitiers, France, to Rome, Italy. At some point, you have to cross the Alps. But Louis began his journey. On St. Louis-Marie de Montfort's way to Rome, he made a detour to the Holy House of Loreto. He spent time there with Our Lady and the angels communicating with them. He may have gone to the Pope for his instructions, but we believe he got most of them right there in the Holy House of Loreto. Strengthened by the love of Our Lady, his bloody feet bathed in the light of her love, Louis gathered enough strength to continue his journey to Rome. As he caught his first glimpse of St. Peter's Dome, he took off his shoes and walked the rest of the way barefoot. The Lord put a priest in his path, who just happened to be the Pope's confessor. An audience was arranged, and in June 1706, Father Louis-Marie de Montfort found himself in a special audience with Pope Clement XI. Louis-Marie was in the presence of a descendant of Peter the Apostle. He humbly shared the work he had done in the Diocese of Poitiers and his ongoing wish to go to Canada to the missions of Ontario or Quebec and minister to the natives of North America. We believe the commitment to submit to whatever the Prince of the Apostles felt he should do. The Pope answered without hesitation, go back to France and to work. It's a field big enough for your zeal. Work against Jansenism. Teach the children their catechism. Teach all Christians to renew the promises they made by themselves or through their godparents in baptism, and always be obedient to the bishop of the diocese. When he returned to the diocese of Poitiers, feet bleeding, his condition badly run down from lack of food and water, and sleeping under the stars, an emissary from the bishop told him he was not allowed to celebrate Mass in the diocese of Poitiers. He walked 18 miles until he was outside the boundaries of his diocese. He was not going to let anyone stop him in his mission. The Pope had given Saint-Louis-Marie de Montfort title 
apostolic missionary, and he was taking it seriously. The Pope had blessed Louis Marie's crucifix, at which he placed it on top of his staff to carry with him everywhere he went. He also gave Louis Marie the power to grant a plenary indulgence to anyone who would kiss the blessed uh, crucifix on his or her deathbed. The only condition was that they repent of their sins and call out in reverence the names of Jesus and Mary. Father Louis headed back to Rhine, where it had all begun 21 years before. There he was asked to speak at many churches and seminaries, although he still looked like a vagrant. On his way to Dinan, he passed through Montfort, the place where he had spent his youth. He begged for food and shelter, not telling anybody who he was. Everyone turned him away except the poorest man in town. St. Louis continued on to Dinan, where he gave retreats and missions, opened hospitals, worked with the poor and sick, taught the children catechism, worked wonders with the military men at the local garrison. By the time he was finished, they were praying the rosary, had put up a painting of Our Lady in their barracks, and lit a perpetual candle in honor of her. When, they, when he left, they promised they would keep it lit forever. Father Louis Marie was recruited to join a group of secular missionaries in a diocese in Brittany. He was well accepted by the people, but as he was very firm, when it came to Our Lord and Lady and the teachings of the church, he found himself an outsider with other priests. He was too stern, unbending, and too overpowering for their tastes. So after he single-handedly gave powerful missions, the priests asked him to leave because he was not one of them. No, he was not. He was an apostolic missionary. He was completely committed to his cause. He was not a compromiser. He had given up his entire life, had ill-treated his own body for the sake of his and other souls. He couldn't allow himself to settle for something other than his conviction. In 1709, Louis went to a little town called Pontchâteau to give a mission. Now, Louis had always wanted to build a Calvary in honor of our Lord Jesus, Mother Mary, and the other members of his Passion. He shared his plan with the people. They chose a spot, a distance from the town, and began to dig. In short order, it was determined that this was not the right spot. So he brought everyone into the chapel to pray for guidance from Our Lady. When they went back outside, they saw two white doves come down out of the sky and settle on the mound which had already been dug out. The doves took dirt into their mouths and flew off. They did this quite a few times. Louis prayed and then realized that the doves were trying to bring them to a place Louis Marie and the workers followed, the dove. They found a hive-shaped mound on the highest point of the area where a cavalry could be built with the crosses seen from miles around, and they began to work. Old timers from the town shared something which had happened 36 years before. They had never been able to figure it out. They had seen crosses coming down from the sky with banners flying from them. The crosses hovered over this spot and stayed for a time. Then there were very loud noises which frightened animals for miles around. This was followed by singing, angelic singing, as if floating down from heaven to earth. They said the date this happened was January 31st, 1673, the day St. Louis-Marie Grignon de Montfort was born. Soon people from all over came ready to build Calvary. Statues of our Lord Jesus, Our Lady of Sorrow, St. John the Beloved, and St. Mary Magdalene were carved as the mountain was being built. Every evening after the workers were finished digging, they went down to the grotto and prayed. The main tree for the Calvary took 24 oxen to bring it to the mountain. The trees of the two thieves were placed, one on the right and one on the left. 150 fir trees were planted for the Hail Marys and 15 cypresses for the Our Fathers. It was a most beautiful tribute to our heavenly family. But as had plagued Louis all his life, the powers of evil were ready to destroy what had been built in honor of God. There was a war with England going on. Those who hated the church, and especially St. Louis-Marie de Montfort, complained to the authorities. The Calvary was in Brittany, which was right across the English Channel from England. If the English should attack, the Calvary would make a perfect fort to use against the French. The project had taken over a year. The solemn blessing was to take place on September 14, 1710, Feast of the Triumph of the Cross. A few days before the blessing, the bishop was pressured by a small group of very local, very special interests with an agenda, and orders were given for Father Louis Marie and his people to tear down the monument built to our Lord Jesus. The words of Pope Clement XI came rushing back to our heartbroken priest, always be obedient to the bishop of the diocese. 
Strangely enough, however, that's not the end of the story. Le Calvaire, or the Calvary, was rebuilt again in 1747. Then the crosses had to be replaced again in 1774 after they had collapsed. And again they were replaced in 1785. The reign of terror that spread throughout France tore down the crosses once again. But the church will never stay down, and after the French Revolution, a new Calvary was built on the same site. Bronze crosses were erected in 1854, the same year that the dogma of the Immaculate Conception was proclaimed. Pilgrimages began in 1873. The Calvary cannot be wiped from this countryside, no more than his death and resurrection. The crosses loom high in the sky, a testimony of love and hope for the world. There are stories of many miracles attributed to St. Louis-Marie de Montfort during his lifetime. There are reports of apparitions of Our Lady. One time, Louis was in the rectory garden praying his office before dinner. A young man was sent to call him in for dinner, but he returned saying, the priest was having a conversation with a lady who was floating in the air. Another time, Louis was leaving a church when a woman came up to him with a child whose head was full of scales and sores. The mother prayed for healing. He put his hands over the child and prayed for a healing to reward the mother's faith. The scales dropped off the child's head, and she clapped her hands and laughed. She was healed. There are many, many stories about miracles attributed to St. Louis Marie de Montfort, but the greatest miracles were the conversions of hardened sinners, Jansenists and Calvinists who came to his missions to disrupt and destroy them. In many instances, because of the conversion of hardened Protestants, Calvinists and Jansenists, Murderers were sent to kill de Montfort. In one instance, a man came into the room where Louis was praying and drew a sword, threatening to kill him if he didn't leave the mission immediately. Louis stayed kneeling and told the man he would die in glory if the man would change his wicked ways. The hands of the man shook so much he had to leave. There was a report that Louis threw a bunch of well-dressed Protestants out of a mission because they were trying to disrupt it. They vowed to get even with him. That evening, he was to go to the home of a sculptor to look at his work. But as he was approaching the place, he was given a word from heaven not to go any further, but to turn around and go back to his quarters. It was discovered later that there were seven men waiting to kill him, some of whom had been at the mission that night. They waited in different places to ambush him on subsequent nights, but were never successful. But one attempt on his life almost got him and weakened to him to the point of being the beginning of the end for St. Louis. After the Lord had successfully converted a high-ranking Protestant, an assassin sneaked into the dining room and put a strong poison into Louis's wine. He drank some of it and immediately spit out the rest. Father Louis took an antidote which prevented him from dying, but his strength gave way. He was near, never the same. Father Louis's last mission began on April the 5th, 1716. It was a strange mission. He commented in that no one attacked him. There were no insults, no bobs, no bishops coming after him. There must be something wrong, he joked. But it was different for him also in the fact that his strength was leaving him rapidly. He never looked so bad. The poison had taken its toll on him. During this mission, he tended to give his talk and, and then returned to the room in the hovel where he was staying. One morning he was late for Mass. The little altar boy figured that he was probably sick and may have overslept. He went to fetch him at the boarding house. As the boy approached the house, he could see through the window the holy priest in conversation with a beautiful lady whose shape radiated with great light. The altar boy waited until the heavenly conversation was over and then brought the priest to the church. He mentioned seeing the lady with Father Louis Marie. Father just smiled and put his arm around the boy You are a happy boy. Only the pure of heart may see that lady. He could feel himself slipping away. He received the last rites of the church. He focused his attention on his crucifix, the crucifix which had been blessed by the Pope when he had been given the mandate and title, apostolic missionary and a statue of Our Lady. These had been his weapons as he went forth to conquer evil and do good. He kept saying, Jesus and Mary... He weakly began to sing the first verse of a hymn he had composed, On, on, dear friends to paradise, God's paradise on high. Whatever be our gain on earth, to sure again to die. His voice trailed off into a coma. He stayed that way for some time. Everyone assembled, prayed for the soul of a man they knew to be a saint, Louis-Marie Grignon de Montfort. After some time, he woke abruptly and cried out, Your attacks are quite useless. Jesus and Mary are with me. 
I have finished my course. I shall never sin again. With that, the slave of Mary left his withered and wa- wasted body behind as he went off to heaven to continue fighting battles from a different vantage point. We told you at the beginning of this chapter that Louis-Marie de Montfort was a prophet of the last days. Even though he lived between the last half of the 17th century and the first part of the 18th century, he left us prophecies which deal with these days. Towards the end of the world, Almighty God and His Holy Mother are to raise up saints who will surpass in holiness most other saints as much as the cedars of Lebanon tower above little shrubs. These great souls filled with grace and zeal will be chosen to oppose the enemies of God who are raging on all sides. They will be exceptionally devoted to the Blessed Virgin, illumined by her light, strengthened by her spirit, supported by her arms, sheltered under her protection. They will fight with one hand and build with the other. With one hand, they will give battle, overthrowing and crushing heretics and their heresies, schismatics and their schisms, idolaters and their idolatries, sinners and their wickedness. With the other hand, they will build the temple of the true Solomon and the mystical city of God, namely the Blessed Virgin. They will be like thunder clouds flying through the air at the slightest breath of the Holy Spirit. Attached to nothing, surprised at nothing, they will shower down the rain of God's word and of eternal life. They will thunder against sin. They will storm against the world. They will strike down the devil and his followers. And for life and for death, they will pierce through and through those with the two-edged sword of God's word, all those against whom they are sent by Almighty God. They will be true apostles of the latter times, to whom the Lord of hosts will give eloquence and strength to work wonders and carry off glorious spoils from his enemies. They will sleep without gold or silver, and more important still, without concern in the midst of other priests, ecclesiastics, and clerics. Yet they will have the silver wings of the dove, enabling them to go wherever the Holy Spirit calls them, filled as they are with the resolve to seek the glory of God and the salvation of souls. Wherever they preach, they will leave behind them nothing but the gold of love which is the fulfillment of the whole law. They will have the two-edged sword of the word of God in their mouths and the blood-stained standard of the cross on their shoulders. They will carry the crucifix in their right hand and the rosary in their left and the holy names of Jesus and Mary on their heart. Mary scarcely appeared in the first coming of Christ, but on the second coming of Christ, Mary must be known and openly revealed by the Holy Spirit so that Jesus may be known, loved, and served through her. Pope John Paul II stated on numerous occasions, the reading of the treatise on true devotion to the Blessed Virgin was a turning point in my life. At the time, he was secretly studying for the priesthood. He has also shared, Whereas I had initially been afraid, lest devotion to Mary might detract from that due to Jesus, instead of giving him his rightful place, I realized, when reading the treatise of Grignon de Montfort, that such was not the case. Our interior relationship with the Mother of God is a result of our association with the mystery of Christ. Dear Louis-Marie de Montfort, I don't have to say rest in peace, but I do ask you, pray for us. Pray to Jesus and Mary that new prophets will rise with courage to serve Mother Church. We thank you, Jesus and Mary, for St. Louis-Marie de Montfort. We thank you, Louis Marie de Montfort, for giving us an important weapon that we can use to help us through our pilgrimage of life, true devotion to Mary.